If we want to protect the places we love, we must vote. But first, let's start at the beginning. Here, 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 and here. Our country claims to be built on a lot of things. Ideals, law, truth. But the one thing that's perfect, what America's actually built on, is the land. This land, this land, this land this land. For some of us, our ancestors have been here forever. Others arrived centuries ago. Others did not choose to come here at all. And others were simply our parents looking to give us new opportunities. But despite our different paths, we all converged here, on this land. Not made for you or for me, but for everyone. You see, the land is our common ground. The mountains, the slopes, the forests, the crags, and the coasts. The places we play and the places we escape to. We cannot continue to allow our seasons to shrink, our rivers to be polluted, our skies to warm, and our forests to burn. So we must rally around the other thing that unites us, our right to vote. Because no matter who you are, if you love the land, you are a member of the outdoor state. 50 million people strong, not defined by borders or party lines, but by passion for places we love, bigger than any other state and more powerful too, but only if we vote. So let's stand for our common ground, whether our common ground looks like this, or this, or this. If you love the land, it's time to make a plan to vote. Make your plan to vote at makeadamnplan.org. All right. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Um, let's see here. Um, I'd like to invite everybody to tonight's digital premiere of the college tour for Purple Mountains. Yeah, so exciting. I've been, I've been, I've been so pumped up to, to watch this film. I've actually held off on watching it until tonight. So, um, yeah, I'm your host, Tommy Caldwell, and tonight we're joined by a man who wears many hats, a uh, professional snowboarder, business owner, founder of PAL, dad, I don't know, I could probably go on and on, but yeah, welcome Jeremy Jones. So excited to see you on my computer screen. <laughs> Likewise, I'll just add a uh, wannabe climber to that uh, list of things since I'm talking to you um so yeah, thanks, yeah for well, here. thanks for being a part of it yeah well i'm a wannabe snow shredder so uh, maybe we can help each other out with that at some point <laughs> <laughs> um cool so I, I thought i'd kick it out off with just um maybe you can give us a little context to why you made this film you know what was the uh what was the process of of this film like so um i just i knew that coming into the fall right now um that i really wanted to bring a film uh, that had a little more than just the traditional like super snow shred type flick that I've made almost a hundred of at this point. Um, just because uh, it's such a critical time right now. And, um, and I guess diving into the film was terrifying, um, which excites me and keeps me up at night, much like uh, before a big line or something like that. Uh, I'm always amazed at how scare you know the things that keep me up at night it's not always the the gnarly stuff but um but yeah try trying to like that video that you were um, that we're both in the common ground video is just really try to understand why we're so divided on climate as a country and it's this film's my journey on that slice of um this climate issue awesome well we'll get back to more questions after the film but with that let's kick it off and watch the movie cheers Cheers. In this highly industrial decade, just how pure is our air? To what degree are we contaminating it by oil and gas fumes? Pollution and overpollution, unless checked, could so warm the earth in 200 years as to create a greenhouse effect. This land that is ours together is a great and a good land. 
It is in that spirit that I address myself to those great issues facing our nation, which are above partisanship. Will your policies become more, say, pro-environment now? They've always been pro-environment. Anyone who allows political bickering to weaken our progress against pollution does a tragic disservice to every American. We have worked as one people for 25 years, as one people. One of the uh, key strategies was to sow doubt about climate change science. There has been consideration both of the scientific certainties and uncertainties. We do not know how much effect natural fluctuations in climate may have had on warming. No one in the science scientific community disputes that this would be catastrophic. The science is screaming at us. If we set our minds to it, we could in this country produce 100% of our electricity. I said before the world that we needed a strong global agreement. The United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. We're getting out. Anchor, I'm going to um, go over this top roll on a belay, and then um, we'll go from there. One, two, three. Woo! Right. How much more rope? Yeah, that's probably your last turn. Okay. Ah! Oh. All right, Jeremy. Be careful. One, two. Traditionally, when we think about climate activists, we might think about conservationists. We might think about people who have dedicated their lives to protecting the environment, or we might think about people who live along the coasts. But the truth is that climate change is impacting everyone. The environment wasn't always a divisive issue. And at the end of the day, what we're fighting for is clean air and clean water and a sustainable future for kids. So why is that so polarizing? How do we get there? You know, when I started Protect Our Winners, I had no idea that um, the front lines would be um, you know, here in Washington, D.C., but it just became clear that real action uh, needs to happen at the policy level, at the federal level, at the international level. Winter as we know it will be half in 2050, and by 2090, 80%, which means winter as we know it will be three weeks long. That is heartbreaking. The winter sports community represents $72 billion, 695,000 jobs, which I point out is 70,000 more jobs in the extraction industry. As bad as that is, and, and the thought of not having winter as we know it absolutely breaks my heart, we realize the global effects on um, the importance of snow for our water. California, 60% of its water comes from snowmelt. The Sierra is this perfect aquifer. The alarms are everywhere. This is the challenge of our time. We represent a huge audience and they want action on this, but we are running out of time. I definitely never thought of myself as an environmentalist. I was not looking to be a so-called environmentalist. But my whole life is committed to the mountains. I ended up having a lot of success going to the world's most beautiful mountains and figuring out how to ride those. The best lines are the ones that you are like, right on the edge of life and death. 
big mountain riding is about exploration and figuring out what's around the next corner. You know, that's where a lot of the buzz comes from. It was through that time and spending time amongst the glaciers that I started really seeing this change. I'm seeing the glaciers recede. I am seeing more consistent rain. I mean, it's nothing's more heartbreak than rain to the top of the mountains in January. At that time, I had a massive carbon footprint. I realized even though my career was just cranking, I couldn't justify that my love was having this just blatant, obvious impact on the planet. The other key factor is I was finding the edge of the boundaries. If I can figure out how to walk for days on end and live out in these mountains and hike up these mountains, I have 90% more of the world's mountains to choose from. My first foot-powered trip in Alaska I got this whole new group of people and I've sold these other people on the idea that, hey, we're going to go out there and we're going to camp and we're going to hike these things. See you later. The problem was I didn't know if I could do it. Holy shit, we should get out of the way. Oh my God. Oh. Are we going to get work right here? I don't think so. when we shifted to foot-powered snowboarding, it brought in so much more complexities. And in many ways, it was more dangerous because instead of being on a slope for one to two minutes, we're on a slope for one to two hours. You are forced to let everything strip away and give the mountains your attention. Yeah, just let me check it real quick. One, two, three. These windows of opportunity when this unridden, big, serious mountain is safe to ride, that window opens and closes with these really little subtleties. Dropping. I'm alive today because of my intimate connection with the mountains. So naturally, I saw changes to the mountains and it coincided with what scientists were telling me. As I've learned about the science and how critical snow is to humanity, I'm like, if we don't have snow, the least of our problems is going to be that a chairlift isn't spinning. The ripple effects on that and the disruption of that, I can't even imagine what that uh, means on society on a whole. Family is hugely important to me. Now my highs in the mountains they're generally tied to being out there with my kids. I really started thinking like, what is the planet my kids are coming up in? Any parent wants to provide their kid with this safe, opportunistic, sky's the limit kind of life. The more that you look at the science, it's really clear that we are doing a major disservice to the kids being born today. I knew that collectively we needed to come together to do something for it. And that's what led me to start Protect Our Winners. I'd like to see if you guys have any calluses on your hands. Um, I bet most of you came from a lot of money and you love to ski, which is something that, you know, people that come from money can do a lot of. The working Americans like myself, which you have nothing to do with and don't understand and you don't respect, they uh, vote and uh, your bull climate agenda is totally wrong. People like you uh, can ski and play in the snow while all of us work our asses off. So 
That's why your organization is not going to be around in about 20 years. I hate conflict. I, I pride myself in always finding common ground with people over anything. My idea of a good time is not debating trolls out there. I mean, there's 413 comments on here. I don't even know where to start. You know, well, here's the classic. Yeah, you fly to Alaska and to Alaska range probably all over the world, and I bet you drive something that utilizes said fossil fuels on a regular basis and those boards you ride have product made from fossil fuels as well. Hashtag hypocrisy, hashtag bandwagon, hashtag don't bite the hand that feeds you. Dude, don't stay stupid crap. This planet is warming with or without humans. It happens every 10,000 years. We all want to keep riding, bro. Coal is cleaner than wind generated. That's, there's just no science. Why doesn't Jeremy Jones set an example and stop using fossil fuels himself? No more helicopter flights, synthetic clothing, or epoxy or fiberglass. My response to that is I live a very examined life, chipping away at my personal footprint. It is important for us to embrace ways to uh, reduce our personal footprint, but we also need large scale uh, systemic change to get the reduction that we need. It's just not getting there with just personal choice. The Earth may or may not be heating up, but there's no debate that the fight over man-made climate change certainly is. We're now at 17 years and eight months of no global warming. Carbon dioxide has not caused weather to become more extreme. We just had two of the coldest years, the biggest drop in global temperatures. Bottom line, big tornadoes, F3 and larger since the 1950s have dropped dramatically. Bottom line, we've gone the longest period without a major US category three or larger hurricane hitting the US. Bottom line. This isn't about science. It's not about facts. This is really about government controlling almost every aspect of your life. 97% of all scientists believe- Is this a bogus number? It's so not a bogus it's number. It's so a bogus Okay, number. yours is, mine no. is yours. A lot of these scientists are driven by the money that they receive. If there was no climate change, we'd have a lot of scientists looking for work. What about Nine? the scientists who say it's worse than ever? Uh, I don't think your party's passionately committed to science or to fighting global warming or to dealing with the scientific facts we live with. I think the science is very mixed. It became clear to me that I live in a bubble with like-minded people and that there was a large population of this country that have different views when it comes to climate. I wanted to know where the spin was coming from, so I decided to reach out to some of the most prominent climate deniers in the country. People that have spent their whole professional career trying to discredit this mountain of scientific evidence, but they're not actually scientists. That's up, Chelsea. Okay, I'm recording. Hello. Hey, Mark. How you doing, Jerry? Hold on one second. I can't hear you. Let me get sound. You see me. You don't see me yet? I don't see you, though. I'd love to see All right. you. Awesome. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, wait. I got you. Cool. All right. To kick things off, again, it's pretty clear that you don't believe in the impacts of climate change. And I guess just getting some background yeah. um, behind why. Well, good question. Uh, yeah, I, I won't go too far into my background, but essentially I come at this as an investigative reporter, not a scientist. I like to joke that I sometimes play one on TV, a scientist, but I look at climate as a essentially a political movement using the latest environmental scare to lobby for politics. When you testified before the House Select Committee on Climate, you know that is one of the most anti-freedom, most regulatory things. They're excited about the prospect of government regulation. So that's where this debate goes off the rails. I mean, I couldn't agree more. The facts should not be political. Hate the fact that it's a partisan issue. I guess as you dug into the science, I mean, what is- Science gets in line behind the preferred policies. And we see this with the National Academy of Science. Oh, this is the body founded by Abraham Lincoln, this August science body. No, it's literally 100% dependent on government funding. Do you have- kids i have four kids they are being taught that 
you know, they're, my old 14-year-old Jeep is not a weather machine. It's not, your know, SUV does not control the weather, that we are not in unprecedented times of any kind. And I tell them not to worry about climate one ounce. It's terrifying for me, um, what I'm seeing happening with snow. It's tough as a business. I worry about my kids. It keeps me up at night. The idea that we face a climate catastrophe is not happening. The idea of a climate emergency is a political construct. When I hear you say about the volatility, the extremes, and the, that's called weather. That's called climate. It does that. You can't predict anything. It's just that when people tell you that, you know, the climate's changing, we're causing it. This is a record here, a record here. It's meaningless. I think the important thing is to understand what it is that divides uh, climate activists and climate skeptics. Really what it boils down to is, are we creating a climate crisis? Are we creating a climate where we have much greater negative impacts than positive impacts? You guys recognize that the earth is warming. You're not sure what the most effective way to address that or how much humans are playing a role in that? I think your question, it presupposes that a warming climate is bad or a warming climate is something that we must fight. Where I live, we get our water from snow in the mountains. Not having snow um, would affect, you know, our, our water source. Well, you make a few points there that um, we see statistics and facts that contradict this. So for example, uh, well, first of all, about the snow, if you go to uh, Rutgers Snow Lab, and what they say is that for the past 30 years, the data that they have is that there's been increasing snow cover extent. Well, I, I guess just to back up that, you know, I am not a climate scientist, but I am someone whose life literally revolves and watches every drop of snow fall on my range. The stuff I do in the mountains is really based around having a really good understanding of, of snow. And so it's easy if you think that if you've heard in the media or from other people, from activists, that global warming is causing a uh, decline in snow uh, to therefore look around and, and try to get a little confirmation bias on that. But the evidence is what the evidence is. On average, the amount of snow cover that you're going to see today is greater than it was 10 years ago, is greater than it was 20 years ago, is greater than it was 30 years ago. And I'm just amused that you would laugh at that when you're just going on subjective thoughts and I'm going on scientific evidence. Misinformation and propaganda works because it's based in reality, but it's not real. Reading a scientific paper and pulling one fact that supports your narrative is how the game works. Because really, how many people read the science? It's only when you dive deeper that you find the real facts and facts don't lie. Satellite data has shown a slight increase in snow cover in the fall, but the average snow cover throughout the year has decreased year after year after year. I've seen it firsthand and I've heard it from real climate scientists. We can choose not to listen or we can choose to do something, but we can't ignore the facts. It's science. The facts are the facts. So I have been talking uh, recently to these professional climate skeptics, deniers, what have you, and um, the consistency of the messaging uh, has been impressive. The fact that many of these people have the same talking points is not a coincidence. Almost all of them are funded through right-wing and libertarian think tanks, and those think tanks are themselves funded by the fossil fuel industry. So there's a very conscious and very deliberate effort to pump out disinformation. It's always been about discrediting the science, trying to make us think that the scientists don't know what they're talking about or that scientists are just in it for the money or the attention. Besides trying to discredit the science, climate change deniers have really played on identity politics. They've tried to make conservatives think that they should not accept the evidence of climate change because if they do, it will lead to higher taxes or bigger government. Have you had any success in changing uh, someone's mind on climate? 
there are some people who are really, really recalcitrant. But in the middle, there's a very wide range of views. People who maybe kind of get the issue, but they don't really understand why it's important, or they've heard these things about maybe it's a liberal hoax, and so they're they're not that happy. And I feel like most of my work is in that space. It's trying to explain to people this is not a liberal hoax. It's not a hoax of any kind. Nobody invented climate change as an excuse to expand big government or raise taxes. But we have this problem, and now we have to figure out what the solution is. And then the other thing is just to remind people of conservative and Republican solutions. We have models of successful conservative interventions. And so then the question becomes, so why has the fossil fuel industry been denying these models? Why does the fossil fuel industry tell you that climate change is a hoax rather than telling you, oh, well, we could fix this with emissions trading just as we did for uh, acid rain? And then that brings to the third important point, which is that this is a big lie. That's actually a con game. That the reason we're confused and divided is because the fossil fuel industry has been trying deliberately to confuse and divide us. ExxonMobil is laughing all the way to the bank, making trillions of dollars in profits off this con game, and we're stuck paying the bill. We have to vote. We have to vote in people who will represent our interests and not the fossil fuel industry. After a decade of going to Washington, D.C. with Protect Our Winners, I've learned that these elected officials don't actually lead they follow the people. And there are a handful of purple states that are equally divided Republican or Democrat that can go either way. These are states that swing elections and these are the places that will choose our course on climate action. But a recent New York Times poll showed that climate is the most divisive issue in our country, even more than guns. So much weight is put on these elections with the hope that people just take 10 minutes out of their day or an hour out of their day every two to four years and just check a box for what they believe in. I live in the blue state of California, just 30 minutes from Nevada, and Nevada is one of those crucial states. It's actually the most mountainous state in the lower 48, so I started exploring Nevada just to get a feel for it. All right, Ming, we might just have to start exploring. Oh, I just really missed carrying a heavy pack. As a country, we used to agree that the environment was worth protecting. Conservation used to be a bedrock issue for conservatives not that long ago. Richard Nixon championed a lot of our environmental laws. He signed the Clean Air and Clean Water Act and created the EPA. Why has it become so polarizing that people have made it their job to troll people like myself that are fighting for clean air and clean water. It's just amazing how divided we have become. Yeah. Just totally blown away at the raw wilderness in Nevada. Everywhere I look, protected land covered in snow that provides water for farmers, family, and a healthy ecosystem. It's what I live for. Seeing new mountains, picking out what really calls your name and figuring out how to climb them. One thing that probably gets under my skin more than anything is when I'm being attacked as being un-American. Because I'm very proud about the country I live in. 
patriotism isn't just about waving the flag around. It's about coming together as a nation and working hard to solve these key issues. America is based on people standing up for what they believe in. It's based on people having different opinions and coming together and finding common ground. What we stop doing as Americans and society is talking to each other. Big badass mountains. Love my Nevada board. The whole point of the climate change advocate uh, alarmism is shame to get you to stop behaving in ways they say are destroying the planet. That's how they've succeeded in it. They run around I always wondered if we are as divided as they say we are. I think everyone wants a clean, healthy environment for their family. We just gotta figure out how to get there. I decided to go to one of the most conservative counties in rural Nevada and talk to these people that love the mountains as much as I do. Right here, we're about a half a mile from the base of the Ruby Mountains. From our backyard, we can hike basically from here to 9,800 feet and ski back to the house in the wintertime. It's a winter wonderland here. I've been involved with National Ski Patrol for 23 years. You know, I grew up in the Sierra foothills and the mountains are my home. That's where I find my peace. It's been a great place for my kids. Skiing is the one hobby that really challenges us. But all of us take an interest in reviving old Volkswagens or old dune buggies and bringing them back to life. Those are things that bring our family together and keep our family connected. Oh, that's a simple thing. Ah, looks like we need a new hose clamp. Oh! Uh. Many of my friends have been born and raised here. I think coming from a place that's very different than this has given me a lot of insight. Like the cool thing around Elko County is trucks, horses, and cows. I mean, I agree those are all cool, but there's a lot of other cool stuff too. Skiing, rocks. I don't think anyone else in my class of like 200 is going into geology. Right now with the climate change, I think it comes down to our groups. Just like high school, we have our little social groups and we want to fit in. If you agree with another group's perspective, your group might say, hey, we don't like that and kick you out. I think a lot of people don't speak up. They just go with the group mentality of they believe this, so I will also. Volkswagen people are their own group. It has no lines. They share a love of driving their old tin cans. Skiing is very similar. They come from all different backgrounds, all different beliefs, but when it comes down to it, like skiers just want to ski. I'm psyched to be at your home mountain. Yeah, this is the Big Elko Snow Bowl. I've patrolled here for a long time. It's a, definitely a great place for local families to learn how to ski. We have our one chairlift. And how much is the lift ticket? $20 for a lift ticket here, $20 for a rental. And if you're just doing the rope tow and you're just getting going, it's, it's cheaper, cheaper yet. What's up, Justin? Nice to meet you. God, pleasure to meet you. <laughs> You're a geologist? Or, or, yeah, yeah. That, was, that was what I went to school for. Mostly what I'm doing now is project management and mining. Yep. Um, both 
here and doing quite a bit over in Kazakhstan as well. Wow, there's some mountains there, huh? Yeah. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. It's awesome to get out here with you. You know, someone who makes their living as a hunting guide. And as I learn more and more about conservation, uh, I've learned that hunters are really the original conservationists, you know, through the Roosevelt era. And quite frankly, I think the outdoor community has a lot we can learn from the hunting community when it comes to protecting these public lands. You, what were you doing at, when you were boring holes underground? Yeah, so in New York, they were fixing the old aqueduct to supply 500 million gallons a day to New York City. We came in, dropped like a $15 million machine down there, put it together, and then drove away from the existing aqueduct, went underneath the Hudson, tied back in. So we'd go down the, the bottom of the shaft, get on a locomotive, go into the tunnel boring machine, and then uh, you'd just be sitting there mining and, and building rings all shift. I'm assuming you must have tons of engineers, like the science and engineering yeah. to do something like that is yeah. cutting edge. It's almost like going into space. I had a great time, but like I said, I, it was either I do that and like focus on a career and money and like a powerful position, or I come out and just focus more on life and living. I'm stoked you hit me up. Yeah, I was surprised. I'm like, man, there's, there's thousands and thousands of riders, like pro riders that probably be, be want to go ride with Jeremy. I don't know why he's, he's calling me, but. <laughs> Dude, you, this is your range, man. You yep. spend more time here than anyone. You're the only local split border I know in, in this area. Oh, I have no doubt climate is changing. I mean, that's a no brainer. Right. I guess my question to you is why is it that like here we're standing on ground that was considerably warmer, maybe a tropical climate at one point. I mean, a lot of the stuff was ocean, which is amazing. So the earth has had several cycles and it's always changing. You're totally right. Glaciers move and shrink. And I mean, they shaped these mountains. That's right. um, it's just that the speed is what the alarm is coming from. Okay. You know, records show that it's happening a hundred times faster than it ever has. Like your world operates on peer reviewed science from the best universities in the world. Right. And that science is from the same universities that the climate science is coming from. Right. There's massive consensus from the scientific community that burning CO2 is warming the planet. I mean, imagine you going down 900 feet down and being like 98.8% of the scientists are telling you to do it this way. The rest are saying you do it that way, you know, you're going to die. Yeah, yeah. I would assume you guys are going with the 98%. I'm definitely not um, like kind of fighting saying, oh no, it's, it's not happening. You don't fight the science. No, no, but it's just tough around here because you know, the climate talk gets lumped into a bunch of other policies that are mostly on the liberal agenda. A lot of times that comes with a, a lot of other stuff that affects their business and their livelihood. And their ideology. For sure, yeah. I'm a single issue voter, as you can tell. Yep, yeah. <laughs> I'll get yeah. past everything. If you're a, like yep. serious about climate, you can get elected, I'm all in. So one of the things that we tried to do is to unify uh, what we call the outdoor state, which is all these outdoor enthusiasts, hunters and anglers, people that really relate to the outdoors, that rely on a healthy environment to come together to fight for the environment. And specifically, we recognize that long-term climate change is the biggest threat. Yeah, because I, I mean, it, it is a common, common thread. I mean, right. I mean, yeah. I think it should be a no-brainer that it's a nonpartisan issue. I mean, it's just a, it should just be a human issue. Unfortunately, I, I think we're going to need something borderline catastrophic, if not catastrophic, to wake people up and to make serious positive change. Unfortunately, right. that's that's what I feel in my heart. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my daughter's only nine years old, and I'm genuinely scared for her future. Yeah. Genuinely. I mean, it's it's no joke. It's hard because the last thing you want to do is like tell your 
daughter that you know it's like everything's fine you know like you don't want to freak them out um, <laughs> but it's like i'm laughing because i've already told her that there are numerous coal fire power plants here in northern nevada held to really strict regulatory standards emission standards you look at the emissions coming out of those coal fire plants in those you know second and third world countries and it's a black cloud coming out of it. And it's, yeah. it's nothing that you see coming out of the ones yeah. here. And like I say, the regulation in the U.S. is far and above the regulation across the rest of the world. We had this whole Paris Climate Accord and we pulled out of it. And it, it was pretty much for that reason was, you know, we the U.S. didn't want to pay for these other countries to say that, oh, yeah, we care about the environment but we're not gonna do anything about it. What bothers me, I think, with some of the climate change legislation and stuff that's gone on is it really affects just our country and we're still doing business internationally. Here we cripple our industry, but we still contribute to pollution by still buying those products from someone else that's just gonna pollute the environment. My big issue with it is, you know, the U.S extracts more fossil fuel than any country in the world. Right. We heavily subsidize it. A ton of it's on public land, and we know that the burning of fossil fuels is a major contributor to warming of the climate. We do know ways to create clean energy. I just would like to see the country embrace that more. At the very least, I'd just love to see an even playing field. It's gonna have to be phased out eventually. Right. You know, just because, I mean, we're, we're gonna run out of those resources. I mean, the main word there is is transition. And, you know, it's not a light switch. You can't just shut it off. And 100%. I mean, There's not a single plan out there that says, like, shut off all coal and oil tomorrow it's um it's this Just depending on who you listen to yeah i mean there there are some and there's there's radicals on either side right in reality everybody's probably looking at something down the middle that right. everyone can agree on but you know politics has become a game recently and sporting event yeah exactly <laughs> yeah fighting. yeah i think the big thing is is the solutions for it you know yep that's where people get hung up i think and it's easier to blame like there's no problem. Well, I think um, debating solutions is a great debate. Right. We have half the country that is poking holes in the science when we need 100% of the people figuring out solutions. Yeah, no, it's for sure. You know, I like to think about it like climbing a mountain. Like, I'm not saying we have the summit ridge. We have our Hillary step to equate it to Everest figured out, but we know which way the summit is. Yep. And we're still in base camp arguing about how to finish the summit ridge. Yep. And it's like, maybe we should just start walking to camp one. <laughs> we definitely know how to get to camp one. <laughs> we actually know how to get about three quarters of the way. No, Let's that's start a... just going one step at a time yeah. you know i think there's a lot we have in common yeah i agree i mean you're hunting in the mountains as i am i'm just hunting for different stuff yeah you're hunting for the ultimate turn i guess and i'm hunting for the elusive mule deer i don't know if i could take the shot because full disclaimer i don't eat meat well full disclosure i'm a carnivore so i'll take the meat <laughs> <laughs> We get some epic sunsets in this state, that's for sure. We're lucky to be here. We are lucky to be here. I appreciate the conversation, it's good. I have more questions than I have definitive answers. I'm not opposed to someone proving me wrong. I don't have that big of an ego where I, I feel that I'll never accept information. I just want to see it presented to me in a fashion that seems credible. I think if you step back, you know, we're all on the same team. We're on team planet Earth. Classic coolie. Yeah, man, we're doing it. Love this stuff. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. 
You got a nice backyard, Danny. That's right. That's what dreams are made of. Think that uh, you know, hard rock miner from Northeast Nevada, the pro snowboarder, California, whatever, really meet up, yeah. and talk about you know everything, and go snowboarding in the mountains. That's that's not something that's normal, but it's the type of communication and interaction that I think we need to get out there more, get different opinions. Coming from a, a bigger city or from a different state, you got different things that push your buttons, different things that's important to you. And just because I haven't thought about it and it's not important to me doesn't mean that it's it's not a big issue. Yeah, Jerry. <laughs> Woo! I met some great people in Nevada, even made some new friends, had some great conversations. And it turns out we are a lot closer on many of these issues. Yeah, get it. <laughs> but the heartbreaking reality is that unless some conservative leaders change their mind on climate, there's no candidates that these conservatives who care about the environment can vote for. It made me wonder if a conservative leader could get past identity politics and take climate serious. Are you afraid of the climate crisis? If I only listened to politicians like Al Gore, I'd be afraid too, very afraid. So I came out of the precincts of the right as a young man. I found myself uh, working at the Cato Institute in 1991. I was hired to oversee their energy and environmental uh, policies. For the better part of the next 23 years, I spent my time at Cato arguing against the case for climate action. You're not that worried. Not particularly. Uh, there have been about 13 studies. Four of the estimates are that the economy would actually improve if we have a But I found my ability to make a convincing case just completely fell apart over time. It's a monumental move that very few people have made. What changed your mind? It was not any one thing. It was a, a series of uh, three or four things. The first thing was my uh, lack of faith in the overarching scientific narratives we were telling. It also became clear to me that I had not been doing my due diligence in really putting a critical eye to the arguments I wanted to believe to be true. That seemed intuitively pretty strong. And I found over and over and over again, I was seeing variations of exactly this kind of thing. Sometimes it was cherry picked data sets. Sometimes it was misrepresenting the position that was actually being taken by the mainstream scientific community. I'd love to just ask you a couple quick fire questions on what, what they're telling me, what I'm consistently hearing. So climate change is natural. We've seen fluctuations through throughout history. That's like saying death is natural. We've seen people die all through history. That doesn't mean that Bob shot Jim. The f kind of argument is that? 
I'm sorry, I'm being, it's Friday. Yeah, I love it. I, that's great. Okay, next one. There isn't a consensus amongst climate scientists on human-caused climate change. Screaming total out of this world goddamn lie. Every single survey of credentialed, peer-reviewed, published climate experts shows a near absolute consensus. Earth is old. We only have 100 years of data. Yeah, both's true. But we know how to estimate temperatures from the past based on, you know, carbon rings and all kinds of sediment analysis and ice core. We're not like making this crap up or playing on a Ouija board. Addressing climate change will ruin the economy. Yeah, these things will not be cheap. It's going to cost, depending upon your estimates and your policy preferences, anywhere between six and 20 trillion dollars to globally decarbonize. But what are the costs of not globally decarbonizing? Well, there'd be a shit ton more. I can tell you, it, my biggest takeaway is is just how blown away I am on their just utter and total certainty that there is no problem here. It was actually like really hard to have a conversation with them because they're so cemented in their point of views. Risk management is not about picking the most likely scenario based on what we know and saying policy needs to be determined on that scenario. You have to weight the probabilities of each of these scenarios coming to play, coming to pass, and looking at the costs and benefits that follow from each of them. And if you do that, it is absolutely unmistakable that we need to decarbonize as fast as possible. Because if we're wrong about the scenario, we don't get the more likely scenario, we get a low probability, high impact scenario. So it's game over, there's no other planet, there's no other way to, you know, we're just, we're completely effed. Yeah. Yep. Hold on. Okay. I got right you. Here. You're good. All right. We're off. So just, we want to move through the convex rolls um, with speed and kind of be a little light on them. And then, Cass, with your line, we just, I, I want to dial you in with the cornice entry. Um, there will be slough, so if you do have to stop or you fall or something in the fall line, expect some slough coming down on you. Three, two, one, drop it! First crux of the day. Meet Jones. Drop. Oh, it makes a nice heel turn into a toe turn. Yeah, yeah. Nice air. Tiff, you should get some mum pal. It's not hard to understand what's at stake here. But sometimes you gotta step back and realize what the fight's all about. We don't have to agree on everything, but we do need to stop arguing and start working together on solutions. We have an opportunity to make real change. Change is scary, but change is constant and with change comes opportunities. Cass. Yeah. Are you going cornice or the rock or are you cross? Cornice. Okay, make sure you have your direction perfect. Oh, so close. Good try. 
I think it was Martin Luther King who said, you can't beat hate with hate. You can't, you know, beat darkness with darkness. It requires light. You see in the media, online, everything, it's all about like, how can we get everyone as mad at each other as possible? I want to do this. The end goal is to try to connect us around clean air, clean water, and a sustainable future. The path we're on is a path of destruction. It's unsustainable. You know, there's a real sense of urgency and that's gonna take a lot of work and that's what we're pushing for. The only way I'm looking my kids in the eye in, in 20 years is going, I fought like hell to try to get us on the right path. At the end of the day, we need climate champions leading our country. We don't need the whole country on board. We just need 51% in the right places. And if I can do that, one voter at a time, that's how it starts, just like climbing a mountain. One step at a time, one voter at a time. Yeah. Can you hear me? I got you. You got me? Yeah. Wow. Nice, Jeremy. Very, very powerful film. There's a lot, <laughs> a hell of a lot to unpack there. Um, man, I think probably one thing that I've been doing a ton of thinking about is, you know, the fact that if we want to solve these problems, we have to come together. And that film did that in a pretty amazing way. So thank you. Thank you so much for making this film, and I hope we can get it out to as many people as possible. I think it be, could be pretty powerful. I think it. I think it speaks to one of the power. One of the one of the great things about it is it, it speaks to people on both sides of the aisle um, pretty effectively. So, thank you. That means a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. You said before the start of this film that this was. You know, you said you've made a hundred films, and this was probably the most intimidating out of all of them to make. I mean, I, when I was watching, I was like, this is indeed was a very bold film to make. Can you put it in your words why it was so intimidating? Yeah, I mean, it's like, for one, it's I'm like having to, like traditionally we make a film and it's like, we'll be talking and then we're like, all right, wake up the audience with some Metallica and someone almost dying and just like crank it up. And so for me to like go into like this, um, you know, documentary space that's not based on beautiful spaces and there's some of that in the film, but there's like, I'm like, man, are we really going to like, show me talking on a computer and all that side of things. And, and it's been wild though. I, you know, I had like a moment right before the, you know, where I woke up in the middle of the night, I'm like, Oh my God, I can't believe you're releasing this film. But I've really, um, since it's been out, I'm just, I've just been at peace with the film. I know that it might upset some people and, but I'm, I'm sleeping fine. Yeah, I mean, everything upsets some people. So, um, yeah, I think yeah, exactly. people, who, who, people who speak our, our minds about what we believe, we gotta we have to sort of accept that at some point. Um, it seemed to me like there was probably a fair amount of like excruciating conversations that happened in, in the making of this film. Um, were, there, were there people um, that you talked to that you wish you could have highlighted, but that didn't end up making it into the cut? Well, I think um, we're going to release some conversations that didn't make the cut. And it's like, it is this nuanced, complex issue 
that for a while we had some, we were kind of all over the place and we're like, we just got to focus into the um, deal and really focus on the people that I don't agree with opposed to some of the people that I do agree with. Um, but I think that the, I would have loved to have some more diversity in the film and we, I definitely interviewed um, um, Green Girl Leah, who you may know, um, a black woman doing incredible work. Yeah. And it just, it, it like, for the slice that we went after is like, why are we so divided on this issue? And it, and it, I hate to say it, but it's, it's largely a, um, it's a white, male like the creation of climate deniers and the that whole if you start peeling back the layers it's like the sad part is um people of color are disproportionately affected by a warming planet but they're not the ones that um have got us in this mess and that was really what our focus was with the film right yeah Nice. Um, same with the indigenous people. I mean, I think there's um, a bunch of it's it's just it's a different film, you know, that whole side of things that like there's a lot to learn from how indigenous people treated the land and things of that nature. But we just kind of had to like pick our slice that we consider the biggest detriment to taking real action on climate. Right. Yeah. The people that are creating the systems that are harming the planet. Absolutely. Makes sense. Um, let's see here. So, um, so I was just in Yosemite and, uh, and one of the, re I, I, I went to Tahoe, like I was talking to you before this call and spent some time with some friends, but I ended up going to Yosemite, um, for just a day. Um, I was planning on staying longer, but um, when I was there, um, I, I, I went bouldering for about half a day in Tuolumne Meadows, and then this apocalyptic wall of smoke moved into the valley and started dropping ash. We checked our Purple Air app, and it was down to it was like 420 parts per million, which is like very, very unhealthy. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, I've been going to that place a lot over the years. You know, Yosemite is kind of where my heart is. I spend several months a year there every year. And, I've, and, and smoke in the fall, not usually this early, but in the fall is always something that has been in existence. Like, forest fires are a natural yeah. part. But it feels, it feels very different um, this year to me. And, and it actually chased me away from Yosemite. And then they closed the valley altogether. Um, which has happened several times in the last 10, four years. Does it feel different to you in that way, being in California right now? Well, it's a great example. Like, I mean, when did you first start going to Yosemite? It was like, I mean, we're talking 20. Yeah, when I, was, when I was three years old, so like 1981, yeah. Yeah, so I think that, like, that's an example of, um, like you have like quite a bit of data of like, I haven't gone there forever. You maybe not the first time you've been chased out by smoke, but at this time of year it is. Um, and that just coincides with, it's like what I'm seeing in the mountains where like, yes, living in Tahoe, we get rain. Um, but it's like rain to the top of Jackson hole. I remember when the patroller was like, oh my God, first time in January, we've had rain to the top of Jackson hole. And then now, you know, that's not all that uncommon. And it's, so it's sadly, and hopefully not this um, new normal, but it's like up until, I don't know, maybe eight years ago, the thought of like, oh, I hope it's not smoky. Um, I mean, that was the first time where it was like, oh my God, I can't like go outside. And um, and now it just seems like we're playing Russian roulette with smoke. And so it's just this example of, you can say all you want, but this is this, um, again, like signs of like this change that kind of becomes this new normal. And I hope it's not, and the, you know, this, this dry lightning storm is, is you know was definitely a different type of storm but um yeah this i guess the main thing is you see firsthand the effects on a community of like you know once smoke hits like it's 
it's over. Like you'd think, you know, rainy weather is tough on things. Like, man, you blanket a community with smoke. Talk about, you know, our town's been packed with people and like you've never seen so many people leave so fast and the effects of that on the economy. And it's the same with if, uh, you know, if a resort doesn't open in winter due to lack of snow, I mean, it's just this ghost town. And, and um, so it just goes back to like, we need clean air, we need clean water for, for these whole huge communities to uh, operate on. Right, yeah. So one thing I was thinking a lot about while watching this film is, is, my, is my family members and friends that, that think differently politically than I do in a lot of ways. And that's what this film is about. I mean, I know you, you kind of sought out people that you could speak to. Um, have you had difficult um, conversations with people that you're super close to, like in your, in your friends and family? And do you have any tips for how to, how to have those types of conversations? Um, I mean... I don't, I would say the one thing like the film, like I had a, someone come up to me two days ago and be like, I'm from Ohio. Um, this film really spoke to me. I'm sending it to my family members who we traditionally can't even talk about climate change because it's just like battle. Um, and so like that is the purpose right there of the film. But the family members, I mean, I definitely, my grandfather was a uh, Republican senator, that a uh, state senator, that um, he did a lot of, protected a lot of wetlands on Cape Cod, so kind of that old school kind of uh, Republican that we reference a little bit in the film. But, um, you know, I, I guess my... Fam, my close family members, like my parents, for example, my dad grew up with as a Republican, who, you know, with the idea of like, I like small government, um, low taxes and like kind of basic Republican. And that as that changed to like now I'm supposed to hate gays, I want to go to war, I hate climate change that he we have forced him to what we like to say is vote for your grandkids. Mm. Um, it seems like to make this film, you had to really dive into the um, conversations that climate deniers are having. Um, ha like, I've, I've been trying to get outside of my own bubble quite a bit, listen to news sources that aren't the things that I would typically um, listen to. Um, do, you, do you have any tips for, like, understanding the other side? I mean, I feel like that's a big part to starting these conversations is you have to understand their viewpoints and try and have empathy for them. Um, like, how did, you, how, did you, how did you start that process to end the understanding? Yeah, so empathy or I don't know if empathy, but understanding of where these people are coming from is important. I mean, there has been this, um, this Amy Westervelt who – uh, work, helped us do some research on the film. She has the Drilled podcast, and she's really researched the birth of climate denial um, from the fossil fuel industry. And they, it's all on record. They lay out their plans. They lay out um, how they're going to create these climate deniers. It's not by chance. It's a lot of white males um, in swing states, uh, and that's been millions of dollars to create these climate deniers and then for me it's been helpful to understand it's like oh another guy just like coming hard at me i'm like oh what do you know white male from this zone and um and so i guess just understanding the creation of that and absolutely like you said like trying to listen um and open up like the the other factor is um this social media kind of digital space that uh, these companies have realized that um, they get people to click more when they're angry. Um, and so they start bombarding these angry type stuff for, uh, you know, whatever your feed is, whatever stance you are. So just kind of understanding how the, the game is played and absolutely listening to there's a you know a, a thing in the film where i'm listening to rush limbaugh and um and i definitely will do that from time to time and and it's amazing you hear him uh, sorry to go on a tangent but one example is 
I was listening to Rush and I had just been with Eric Larson in Washington, D.C. And I'm listening to Eric Larson, this polar explorer, tell um, the on Capitol Hill, he's like, I think I'm the last person to go to the North Pole in summer. This is something I did 10 years ago. I literally had to do it in a dry suit, towing a kayak and like swam to the North Pole. So I'm driving home from that and Rush Limbaugh goes on this nine minute monologue how there's actually more sea ice in the North Pole now. And it is so good that I'm like pulling into my house. I'm like, this is sweet, man. Not, no problems here. Like, love what he's saying. I wish it was true. I'm like, man, I just like watched a slideshow of, of Eric Larson swimming a route that he previously could walk 10 years ago. <laughs> Wow, that's a pretty crazy, crazy story. Um, well, I, I think a little bit about what I can do personally um, in my home state of Colorado. And I think similar to California, there's a lot at stake here because really a lot, I mean, most people move to Colorado because, um, because of the recreation opportunities, because of the mountains, because it's a beautiful, wonderful place to experience the mountains and um i think this film articulates kind of like the the kind of short-term economic crisis that this <laughs> that this could um that this could create like if the ski resorts are, and, I, and i feel like california like the effects of climate change are more visceral in california than they are in, in colorado a little bit in a little bit like we have forest fires here but they're not as t intense like temperature is a little bit colder so maybe we will we will hold snow for another decade you know at the high elevations beyond Cal california but it's going to shorten the ski season which is a huge economic driver here um in colorado as well so um i think that there's so much at stake here not only the future for our children and our children's children, but also just like the short term economics of like what it means to be somebody who loves living in the outdoors, the health of, of people. Um, we really got to start figuring out how to, how, how to figure this stuff out. And I think the first step is, is learning how to come together and talk about these issues. So like I said before, um, thank you so much for making this film. Um, I think it's, it's gonna, it's gonna be a seed for me to start these conversations. I'm gonna start sending it out to those people that I've had a hard time having conversations with, get their take on it. And I think I, I think I learned a lot about how to talk, like just the way that you talked in the film to people of the other side was, and, and I, you could see it in the film, you guys kind of came together and you, and you were friends at the end. And that was pretty incredible to see. I think that's something that hasn't happened enough. Um, these days well i think what you realize is like when you're in online and everything's just so divisive is like it's in the real world that is not necessarily the case um and but there's like just it's a guarded deal and and the reality is is um these big industries, like they don't want to hear that we're having a town hall meeting just to talk about climate change. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa don't do that. We need you fighting with each other. And um, and so for me, like if you have some connection to the outdoors, um, I can find common ground with you. I mean, there's so much we agree on. It's like you go for a walk in the woods and like for me, like I'm not a hunter but understanding the process to hunting and stuff i mean that's really interesting to me and so i guess it's um it's just we're not as divided as we see as 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 like the if you open up the news it makes it sound or say as it looks at, as we are online um but i guess the one of the toughest like parts of the film is like i absolutely make like Danny, who I go snowboarding with, like I for sure, like I've been to his house now and went mountain biking with his family and had dinner, or, um, you know, had a picnic with his family in his backyard. Like this is a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. um, but it's heartbreaking because there's no way, like because it's a, a identity politics, these, you know, even though we agree on a bunch of stuff, there's, there are going to vote for a climate denier. And um who's doing everything uh you know the current administration is just they're incentivizing the fossil fuel industry 
Uh, and it's just, we're not going to get there without policy change. And so that's like really gutting to me. Um, and I remember the filmmaker bones, who's the director who you may know. I mean, after like a, two days after coming home from Elko, he's like, how do you feel? I'm like, Oh my God, I'm just like so exhausted and like deflated from that trip. Mm, interesting. Yeah, these conversations are hard, no matter what. But they need to be. They need to be had. <laughs> yeah. um, so we're gonna take some um, questions from the audience in a second here. But before we do that, I think a lot of people watching this are probably wondering what they can do right now. Like, what's what's step number one? And really, um, right now, the most important thing, most important step that you can take is is to make a plan to vote. Um, you should join the outdoor state make a plan to vote and get out there and vote as somebody who really wants who believes in climate change i think it's it's proven that especially for young people this is a college event if if young people show up this election um climate deniers will get voted out you know that's <laughs> that's like the strategic key in my mind um do you do you agree with that yeah i mean i think that it's like as uh, and i've been there you Got a nice cameo in the film, which I was psyched to uh, see. But, you know, we've been to Capitol Hill together, and you realize, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but our elected of officials really, um, I wouldn't necessarily call them leaders. They're more followers in the sense of, like, when this big voter block comes and says, we are voting for you for your ideas, they now are empowered for that. And nobody has ever lost an election because of their stance on climate. And when you see these politicians talk, there's a reason why they don't feel like they're talking to the outdoor state or talking to this younger generation, because traditionally both the outdoor state and these you know, 18 to 35 year old uh, demographic is traditionally not been great voters. They're getting, you know, the and you compare it to the 65 to 85 year old voter block, and they're getting outvoted significantly. So that's why these politicians are older. They're talking to these older people because those are the ones that, the ter that determine if they keep their job or not. So the X factor is at Protect Our Winners, we call it the outdoor state, is the 50 million people who identify with the outdoors and this younger traditional non-voter. And that's why we are pushing so hard for the vote. and. Just a quick story on, um, you know, it's like part of us is like, man, do we got to keep pushing the vote? And, and we learned in 2018, we did a big campaign to get people to pledge to vote. So that means they had to like fill something out, send themselves postcards, da, 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 and we were able to track it. And of the thousands of people that did that, only 30% of those people actually ended up voting. Um, and so that's when it's like, sorry, like we got to, you got to hit someone, a non-voter 12 times to get them to become a voter. And that's our focus at POW is because we know that like trying to flip like a dark red person, like the, that just takes too much energy. And, and our hope is to get out the traditional non-voter and get them to understand that democracy requires participation and your vote matters. Do you have a good read on why only 30% um, got out and voting? Is it like laziness? Is it logistics? Or is it uh, indecision about what the right vote is? You know? I mean, I don't want to, um, I think it's the, for, you know, the, I hate to say the word laziness, but like they had the intentions and life got in the way and they're like, oh, whatever, I didn't make it. And then this particular election um, due to the pandemic, voting is more complex than it's ever been. And, the, and not by chance, these key swing states is where it is the most complex. And so this makeadamnplan.org uh, voter tool, I've had a bunch of kids, first time voters be like, Oh my God, thank you so much. I mean, this is like one stop shopping, like don't have a stamp. Cool. We got a stamp for you. Don't have a printer. We can help you. I mean, it's like, you just need to, you get plugged into that and it's like really simple to turn you from a, you know, not registered, never voted before to voting. Yeah. I know Pal's coming up with so many good tools. Um, 
it's, I mean, it's a little bit easier to get your mind wrapped around which president you want to vote for, but the, uh, the local elections are a lot harder. And, and the voter guidebook, the POW Action Fund voter guidebook is such a good resource. Everybody needs to look out for that. Um, that is an incredible resource for people to, to get out, to have. Um, cool. Let's go, let's go to some questions from the crowd. We've got some good ones coming in here. Great. Um, okay, so here's one. Um, this one's for me. Not sure if, uh, oh, have I seen any changes to the rock um, as a climber? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty easy to, to think of ice and snow as this big changing thing, but I actually have seen a lot of changes to the rock. Um, a lot of the bigger mountains that I climb, um, specifically in the Alps and Patagonia, these are mountains that for the, you know, human history have been well frozen together. Um, and not a lot of rock fall. And now we're get, they're warming up, they're thawing out. Um, you know, Chamonix is a really good example of this. Like whole mountain sides are basically falling down. The mirror to glass has receded like <laughs> half a mile in depth or something. It's kind of insane. But also the, the lifts there are, um, are starting to destabilize because the frozen ground that they're anchored to is thawing. And so these big long cable cars are having to shut down and kind of remodel and, um, and big changes are happening. But for me specifically, the place that it's affected me, uh, well, there's two places that affected me a lot. Um, one is in Patagonia in Southern Argentina. Um, when I used to go there, um, when I first started going there, there was a lot of these rock faces that were easily accessible. Uh, you could just walk across these glaciers, but the glaciers have started to break up. And so now there's big crevasses blocking the passage to these climbs a lot of times that I've kind of dreamed of doing. Um, but the more severe impact is that the, we're getting these big, long, hot weather spells in this place that didn't historically have that, which in some, that sounds great from afar, right? It's a place with terrible weather, right. big, like clear weather. You think you should go out and, uh, and go climbing and you won't get stormed on. Um, but what that means is that these mountains thaw out and rocks start falling. And I've, I've noticed that every good weather window in Patagonia during high climbing season, somebody dies now. And um, because of rock fall almost every time. And so that's huge. It makes me basically this place that's probably one of my favorite places in the world to climb. I'm like, I don't think I should go there. It's become too dangerous. Um, that's pretty severe. Yeah. I have a friend who's a grew up on base of, um, you know, a mountain guy been in the mountains his whole life and um he is told me he's like you know the summer was my time he's a gnarly snowboarder does you know serious mountains and he's like oh the summer used to be so relaxing for me i could just like get on rock i wasn't worried about the world coming down on me as he is in winter and he's like and he's like not only is rock fall an issue but they've had some stuff fall that they just were like considered just the most bomber granite and that they never remotely considered dangerous and um so yeah really the locals in chamonix maybe more than anywhere i've been in the world are just like so seeing climate change because they live amongst those glaciers and have for for a long time yeah, I mean, it's weird to, to have these places, the safe season used to be the summer, and now the safe season is kind of the winter. Yeah. Um, and then Yosemite, for me, the, the climbing season has shifted by a full month in the last 15 years. Um, I used to always go there in October, and that was the best time. Now it's kind of too warm to go in October, and so now I go in November. Um, and that's that's really only happened over like 10 or 15 years that I've noticed. Right. Um, okay, so here's another one. I have some friends that don't want to vote. What are your most powerful arguments to use to get them to vote? Hmm. I mean, maybe get them to watch Purple Mountains. Maybe that will inspire them. But I, I guess, um, you know, there. It's just we're not. We need large scale systemic change and policy change and for CO two reduction. And we're just not going to get a handle on climate without that and um it's just i don't know it's it this the stakes are so high now especially this election and it's an all hands on deck moment and it's 
it's really, and I guess a big thing that I am seeing is like this kind of narrative of like, oh, both options are really bad. And it's like, that just is not the case. I mean, this current administration rolled back 86 CO2 um, or environmental reducing um, laws. Um, the Biden-Harris campaign is got very aggressive first 100 day plans and it's really laid out and, and the difference between the two are really significant. So um, yeah, get, yeah, please, I don't try to send them to me. Tell them to send me a direct message on Instagram and we'll have a talk. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people's sentiment is they don't like any of the candidates and that happened in the last election. Um, it's happening again in this election. And I will say that I have some friends that decided not to vote in the last election, but they kind of see the overall effects of that. And, uh, you know, not voting right now is basically voting against the climate. That's what it means, um, the way that things are currently playing out. And so I think in some ways you need to look past the candidate. You need to look at the overall stance of the party and the staff and, you know, oh, all that kind of thing. Tommy's gone. Let me see if I can pull up. a. I just want to say I'm looking at this polling, and um, I love that we got a – Republican on there uh, to the independents. Uh, interesting factoid: When I was 18 and registered to vote, I registered as an independent, um, and I'm still registered as an independent. And um, that's, I guess, you could say I haven't voted as an independent, um, but you know, I'm still. I think the unicorn, um, and sadly, it's not in this election, but. Um, Ideally, as I touch on in the film, where we need, um, it's like, we need to be, I'm totally open to debating on the right path forward to deal with climate change. Um, but the fact that we're still hung up and debating um, if it's even happening has been you know, it's just this, been this great stall tactic. And, and I guess a interesting change that we have seen to that um, in our last trip to Capitol Hill is it caught us off guard as the Republican Party started. Um, we, I mean, up until last September, uh, you couldn't get them to say the word climate change. And so they openly uh, kind of caught us off guard was saying their rhetoric had changed to well, it appears the climate may be changing. Humans may be um, part of the problem. We should do so, some more research and look at some solutions. And that statement in 1980 would have been a great statement, but we need much more urgency um, on climate now. And if you think about it, it's like those are like the 12 – most sufficient words or efficient use of words to just kick the can down the road um, and not have real action. And it was wild because when I got to Elko and started hanging out with these people, they were saying those exact same words. Um, so that was interesting. Um, hey, Jeremy, can you hear me now? I'm trying okay. to see chats. Okay. How did this film came to be named Purple Mountains? Um, I hope you guys understood that um because i view it as purple states and i like to say how do you get a purple you need red white and blue um and that's a thing with um protect our winners we had an interesting story with this whole um we did this kind of take back the flag program no oh, hold on tommy is on can you hear him i'm out okay i, I can hear you Jeremy. i don't hear tommy maybe they don't hear me Maybe I'm talking uh, to myself. Can't hear me. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess in case you guys can't hear Jeremy. Um, I do not hear Tommy. Oh, okay. Um, one new message. So, Jump okay. to so recent. they can still hear us. We just can't they hear each other. see me. Oh, that's it. We can hear both of you. You just can't see each other. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Uh, okay. Very odd. 
All right, we must be doing our job. Like we got cyber hacked. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so in case I am still here, but Jeremy is not, um, I'm going to continue on with some of these questions. So, um, do you believe that there is a wet way to separate climate from partisanship? It seems too ingrained in the pundit narrative to Well, I don't know. I think that might be a wrap. <laughs> How do you most effectively approach, introduce this conversation to a climate denier? Ooh, man, there's a little bit to unpack in that one. Um, I mean, I think that what you do is you is you. I'm gonna let Tommy take it away. I don't see him. <laughs> cool, Jeremy. Yeah. Okay. I'm just I'm just communicating with Jeremy here really quick. Okay. So, anyways, so that question about um, is it. Okay, so do you believe there's a way to separate climate from partisanship? It seems to um, integrate in the pundit narrative to ever change to me. How did you most effectively approach introduce this conversation to a climate denier? I mean, this is really a question for Jeremy, but um, I've thought a fair amount about how to do this, and it's to, it's to find the things that you agree upon. I mean, this film was great because it went out. And they talked, you know, Jeremy talked to split borders, they talked to skiers, and they, and they could agree on that, and that helped them come together. They built a friendship that kind of transcended the, the partisanship, and so that was pretty powerful. Um, let's see, can you hear me now, Jeremy? I'm back, sorry. Good. Okay, cool. <laughs> Uh, nice. We lost you for a second, although you said some great stuff. I think that uh, I think people could hear you the whole time. Apparently, <laughs> uh, we're talking over you. I thought you were gone. I'm like, all right, I guess I'm yeah, here. I think it all worked out. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back into dive into a few more questions. This one that I was trying to answer when you came back on was great, but I'm gonna read it to you again. Um, do you believe there is a way to separate climate from partisanship? It seems to ingrained in the pundit narrative to ever change to me. How did you most effectively approach slash introduce this conversation to a climate denier? So I guess to stick with the partisan part of that um, deal, when we protect our winners, we've been going to Capitol Hill for about 10 years now pretty regularly. And when we go, we always, um, about 70% of our meetings are with what we would consider a moderate Republican with hopes of getting them to take a good vote on climate. Um, and it just, you know, and we've seen a couple, it's like not by chance every once in a while that person will cross the aisle and vote on climate. And that's someone we would have, you know, Lisa Markowski from Alaska, I believe is either an independent or a Republican, but met with her a lot. And it, whenever that happens, you're like, oh yeah, no, that met with them a lot. And, and again, it, it comes down to, which is understandable, um, they right now there's a ton of fossil fuel money in um congress so if they take a bad vote um that's you know a pro climate vote then they're going to have a hard time getting reelected cuz the you know the next candidate they get primaried where another republican will come in with a ton of money and um and now they have a hard time keeping their job so it's it needs to be a top three issue and we need to, it's never happened. Um, nobody's ever lost their job because of in, the stance they've had on climate. And, and when that happens, I think it will, it'll change really quick because behind the scenes, there is quite a bit of Republicans that want um, political cover. Um, but the reality is it's not happening in this election and hopefully next election it will. Yeah, I sure hope so. That'd be amazing. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Some of my lobbying trips, I've talked to some of the, uh, being a politician has got to be so crazy right now, but um, I've talked to some of the staffers and some of the lawmakers about the kind of people that are coming and lobbying to them. And they say, 
it's about 10 to 1 in terms of fossil fuel industry lobbyists versus um, climate climate change champion lobbyists. Um, I'm not sure if I used the right verbiage there, but the because of the resources from the fossil fuel company being fed into lobbying, they get a pretty skewed perspective of sort of the, the sentiment that's out there, I believe. And so really the only way to change that is through the vote. Because I, I personally believe that more people than not really, really believe in climate change. And, and even if they don't, they don't want to make that bet that it's not a thing, you know? It's like, if you're, if you're betting against climate change, you're sure making a big bet. And um, yeah, yeah, what if you're wrong is a good yeah. question. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, how do you stay motivated, Jeremy? Well, I stay motivated. Um, one, you know, I, I think that like I have this voice and I have this voice because the outdoor community has supported the movies I make, the product I support, and they have given me this platform. And I'm seeing this change before my eyes. It's heartbreaking to me. And to not, um, use my voice um, to fight for what I am seeing is this injustice is just disrespectful with the opportunity that I've been given. Yeah, I mean, I think as, as outdoor enthusiasts, when we see something that we want or we see something that's a big threat, it's that in itself is a motivator. So as things heat up, as the planet heats up and as politics heat up, I'm finding it easier to find motivation. Um, although sometimes it's a bit demoralizing, but you kind of got to push through that and <laughs> let, let the fire fuel you, you know, that's, that's kind of my answer to that. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm a devout member of the church of the seven day recreationalist. And um, <laughs> Love that. So especially as like, I know um, the, as we ramp up into the election, I mean, we're in, you know, about to get into like kind of in like third, third, fourth, touching fourth gear right now. And as it really ramps up, um, even if it's just like a half hour, I have this like power source that is like, I can, you know, I get so much out of a little bit and just like, yes, this is the right thing. And then it's just like to, you know, I need to be able to look my kids in the eye and in the future and be like, I did everything I could, man. I put, and that's, it's like climbing a mountain. Like you go um, and give everything you have. And sometimes it's not in the cards and you have to turn around, but I had never have regret on, you know, if I do have to turn around or what have you, or don't achieve something to me, it's, um, it's like, give it your all. And, and, and that's really all we have the power of doing. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll do one last question and then we'll wrap it up here a little bit over time. Um, but, uh, how, like, how did this film can come to be named purple mountains? Yeah. So it's one, it's like, I look at, um, you have these dark blue States and you got the dark red States. Um, and we know how those are going to go, but this election is going to come down to that, those half a dozen or maybe a little bit more um, states that are really, you know, the swing states. And so that's, I call those purple states. And, and what I do love about purple also is it's, it's, you know, how do you get, make the color purple, red, white, and blue. And so it, and then, you know, the very majestic, um, patriotic song, Purple Mountains, and what have you. So that's how I got there. Awesome. Um, great. Jeremy, this has, been a, this has been an incredible conversation. Thank you so much for making this film. Thank you so much for, um, you know, like doing the hard work. You're out there. You're, do, you're boldly kind of like doing some of the most uncomfortable hard work out there, and I admire that tremendously. Um, to everybody else, oh, go ahead. I just sorry when it comes to hard work. I mean, you've been um, just to see you roll up your sleeves on this issue. Um, no stranger to hard work, uh, to say the least. Uh, one of the I love the persistence um, of the Don Wall, but it's been really admirable to see you just really not just say like, yeah, I care about climate, but to like really understand it and bring like the real energy and. Um, 
an effort and under and really try to understand the issue and um, it's just been really impressive so uh, I can't we're all doing this together and that's to me what it's all about is together we can protect our winners and you are one of the greatest examples of that well thank you Jeremy I mean you have been one of my greatest teachers and protect our winners has kind of been the source of so many of the resources to help you know, helping this, helping this fight, I guess, of, of, of climate change. Um, so everybody else out there, make sure to make your plan to vote. Can you give a quick recap of like the best uh, way to do that? Make a damn plan dot org. Everything you need, and um, yeah, huge props to everyone out there that um, that came and sat down with Tommy and I, and just spread the word. Get other people to watch that, and and just let's. Get this revolution. We need a revolution, and it starts with people like you guys so and girls. So thank awesome. you. Thanks, Jeremy. Have a good night, everyone. Cheers. The outdoor community is over 50 million people, and that's almost 40% of the number of voters in the 2016 elections. And the outdoor community and young people are historically bad at turning out. Even if you feel like it doesn't matter, just please, please, please vote.